God let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and our redeemer. In a world teetering and tottering, you are our sure foundation. We come again to the rock of our salvation, asking for a word for the living of these days. Let it now go forth. Let it not come back void. But let it accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. To bring light into the darkness of which we live. To bring strength where we have known only weakness. To bring hope where we have been hopeless. And joy even in the midst of sorrow. Comfort the disturbed. And if you need be, Lord, disturb the comfortable. But let it all over down to thy glory and your honor. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. God, we give you thanks. Let us all say together, Amen. Amen. We're standing all over the building, and as you stand, just give God another praise. Because God inhabits the praises of God's people. God literally descends to sit upon the throne of the praises that we offer. And praises go up. God's blessings come down. In fact, just go get in one more praise so God will bless your neighbor. Get in one more praise. Tell your neighbor, this is for you. Lift him up so that his blessings will fall down like teardrops, like dew drops in the morning. I want to direct your attention to the gospel as recorded by St. Matthew. And I'm going to start with the first verse in the 28th chapter of Matthew to pick up where um, Reverend Harris left off. I would say to the music ministry, you've been hitting on all cylinders. It's like you had my request list. Manifest, you saying that. Then Kent Quinta came and let us know marriage is suiting him well. He said, just pray, just pray, yeah. That man sang like he honeymoon happy. <laughs> Amen. Count it all joy. Amen. Dennis, of course, had an extra <laughs> junk of kapa laka, whatever kind of hyper caffeinated drink this morning that set him into overdrive. Amen. And uh, it has been a good morning. God has blessed. How many of you have already been blessed? Already been blessed. I mean, come on. Have you been blessed? Have you felt a little something already? Uh, I'm reading from the King James just because in the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher, the grave. And behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. 
And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. I have told you. And they departed quickly from the grave with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then said Jesus unto them, be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there they will see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the soldiers came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. When they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say this, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ear, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were told. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews to this day. In scripture as it is written. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and each other. On this third Sunday of Eastertide, resurrection season, I want to use as a subject, they took the money. In case your neighbor did not hear me, would you, for me, touch your neighbor and tell him right now, they took the money. I'm glad we have Children's Church this morning because I want to begin with an impolite story. Kind of an adults only story. It's a story about a wealthy man who went to a woman and offered her an impolite proposition. He said to her, if I gave you $5 million cash right here, right now, would you sleep with me? $5 million, one time, one time only. We would be careful. Someone has already made up their mind. God help us today. God help us today. Somebody's already trying to rationalize, saying the Lord knows my heart. <laughs> but as the story goes, $5 million cash is right here in the suitcase. You can count it. One time, one time only. We'll be careful and take precaution. There'll be no passing of no STDs. There'll be no... Pregnancy, all of that will be ruled out. There'll be no pictures, no cameras. There'll be no record. No one will ever know. She said, $5 million. He said, yes. One time, one time only. She said, yes. <laughs> we'll be careful. There'll be no side effects, no lasting consequences, no. No one will ever know but me and you. 
no one. This is for real. This is for real. Five million dollars one time. She said, yes. <laughs> he then quickly followed up and he says, I have a second question. She said, what is that? And he said, would you do it for $50? <laughs> and she slapped him and said, what kind of woman do you think I am? <laughs> and he said, we've already determined that. Now we're just negotiating the price. If you remember nothing else about this sermon, remember this. Evil is always attempting to negotiate and renegotiate the price of our cooperation. Let me say that again. Evil is always attempting to negotiate or renegotiate the price of our cooperation. That is one of the subtexts that percolates up, shivers up from the text that is before us. Now you got to go a couple of chapters back to put this text in context with the 26 Seventh and 28 chapters, they all open with mind-blowing details. In the 26th chapter, in the second verse, I believe it is, it says that after this, Jesus told his disciples how the Son of Man would be offered over for crucifixion and, and then be put to death. And then the verse following, it says that the chief priests or the elders and the Pharisees met in the home of the chief priest, a man named Caiaphas, and began to conspire how they would quietly put Jesus to death. They wanted to kill him without notice. They wanted to throw a rock and hide their hands. They wanted to move with a sleight of hand. They wanted to be killers, but they still wanted to appear as pious priests, smiling faces, tell lies. And so one of the reasons they wanted to kill him quietly is they're afraid of these crowds that he had fed fish, lo fishes and loaves and healed their wounds of psyche and body and called them from the margins of life into the mainstream. The population of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus was typically about 25,000 people. But during the time of the festivals, the Passover, the Feast of the Harvest, the Pentecost, the crowds would swell for sometimes as much as five times to 100, 125, as much as 150,000 of people who ebbed in for the festival and would flow out when it was over. These crowds often put the Romans who occupied this territory and their soldiers and their officials on high alert, fearing that during these high rites, these Jewish festivals, while they had the advantage of the crowds, they might try to take advantage of a religious holiday for a political purpose, and they might try to raise up against Rome. And so the Jewish officialdom, the Pharisees, who were the interpreters of the law, the jurors, the Sanhedrin, under the rule of the high priest, Caiaphas, met at his house. They met in mar lago They mean they met at his house. I'm sorry, that was a slip. How they would put Jesus to death. And then, on about the 14th verse of the chapter, 
it says that Judas Iscariot, he, for reasons that are not given us, goes to them as if he knows what's on their mind, which did not take a stretch because there was tension. It was tension between the Jewish officialdom and this itinerant and his followers who were stealing away their crowd. Like there's tension between the speaker of the house and a certain demented woman in the house who wants to hold over his head the possibility of calling for a vote to remove him. And, uh, and the scribes and the Pharisees collaborate on how they might kill Jesus. And no sooner do those words fall from their lips that one of Jesus hand chosen disciples go to them and say to them, what will you give me? If I will give him to you, the negotiation has begun. They want him. I want you to have him. We don't know why. And it says that they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver, 30 Roman coins, which typically had 14 grams of silver, which by today's pricing cost 63 cents a gram. So 30 pieces, 14 grams per coin is 63 cents per gram would be the equivalent of $264 and some change which in my vehicle would be a little less than four tanks of gas. That was the price they negotiated for the betrayal, the offering up of the Lord of glory. Less than four tanks of gas, Chuck, $264 and some change was the negotiated price. Or to say, James Brown said in the song, The Big Payback, you sold me out for chicken change. <laughs> you young people, ask your granddaddy, one of your aunties, what? Chicken change, you sold me out, the Lord of glory, for chicken change. And later on in the 26th chapter, we see that uh, that was the price. He took the money. Later on, after the Lord's Supper, he says, at the supper, he says that one of you will betray me. And they begin to go around the table, man to man, Lord, surely not I. And then Judas said, Lord, is it I? And he said to him, you have said the same. You've said it. But he said in confirmation, he says, the one that betrays me is the one who's dipping his hand in the cup with me. Now, understand. According to their ritual, you pass the cup to the right. And the one who dips in with you was the one who was immediately to your right. Which means Judas was sitting to his right. And because they didn't sit in seats at a table, in the U-shaped table, they sat on pillows, cushions on the floor, and they lounged, and then they leaned to the left. They passed the cup to the right. They leaned to the left, and when you leaned to the left, you laid into and laid your head against the bosom to the person to your left who passed you the cup that you dipped with. So with your head on the person's bosom, you dipped in the cup. The one who betrayed Jesus had his head in his bosom. Be careful who you put to your bosom. Proximity does not mean loyalty. Usually people who betray you are right up underneath you. And it said later on that night when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying with such, with the weight of the world literally on his shoulders, it said that Judas, the same one who laid his head in his bosom and dipped his hand in the cup with him, for that said negotiated price of 30 dirty pieces of silver, he showed up with soldiers 
And Hedron had no soldiers. The soldiers were given him by Pilate. Pilate is called the governor, not as we know him, not a person who's the result of a public election. Pilate was a wealthy Roman citizen who was appointed by Caesar, who sits in Rome and controls the occupied territories of Rome by dispatching persons from Rome to be an extension of the empire in all of its conquered territories where his soldiers now occupy for control of Rome. Screaming Eagle, the symbol of Rome, stands as lamp posts on streets and the milestones track all the way back to Rome. Pilate is Caesar's appointed ruler who has one job, advance Rome's military and economic interests in this occupied, conquered and occupied territory and keep the local people quiet. Don't allow any insurgencies. Make sure there's no January 6th type uprisings. And you have at your disposal soldiers of Rome, if you need violence, if you have to unsheathe your sword to handle it, handle it. But you also have suitcases of cash because what you can't put down with a sword, put it down at a price. Those of you remember that in the Iraq and Afghanistan war, the way in which we gained entree into the Afghanistan tribal villages and so forth is we literally took in caches of U.S. currency and paid off the tribal elders. And so soldiers in cash is what Pilate was equipped with to keep the locals under control. And... After they've negotiated, they've reached into the suitcases with the cash to get an inside man. Then the inside man comes with the soldiers to get the man that they perceive to be a threat to both the Jewish officialdom and the empire because they've said he calls himself a king of the Jews. And with a kiss, our Lord is betrayed. In the 27th chapter, all of the crucifixion is played out in the god-awful and ghastly means by which an individual was very publicly tortured as a form of tyranny, state tyranny, to show all the others what could befall them if they challenged or resisted the power of Rome. And as the sun sets, as the Sabbath kicks in, the lifeless body of Jesus is taken off the cross given to another wealthy citizen, Josephus, who has recently hewn out of the rock a grave for himself and now begs the body of Jesus because he had become a follower of Jesus. And now he lays Jesus' lifeless body in the grave, rolls a large stone in front of it, a stone that took a couple of men to roll in front of it, and then he goes away. And when you think the credits are going to roll... Those who've been creeping at tiptoe posture and moving undercover with sleight of hand all along. They then, the, the members of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the elders, Caiaphas, they go back to Pilate. And they said, this, this, this deceiver, they called him. It's amazing when liars call you a liar. It's amazing how election deniers, which is really election liars, say they're concerned about election integrity. <laughs> That'd be like Hugh Hefner and P. Diddy talking about celibacy. <laughs> Even the sound system said amen to that. <laughs> amen lights. <laughs> and 
And he said, while the deceiver was still alive, he said, if we tear his body down, he'll raise it up in three days. So now you gave us some soldiers to arrest him. We need a few more soldiers to, to go and be on watch at his grave because what we fear is that his disciples will try and come at night and roll that stone away and take his body out and then say there was a resurrection. We don't believe in no foolishness like that. However, they do. And we want to make sure he's not another martyr who becomes greater in death than he was in life. So we want to avoid the possibility of them even suggesting the same. Because if they say that he raised up, we're going to show them his dead body and put that mess down. So give us some soldiers. You gave us some to arrest him. Give us a few more to secure the grave. And Pilate said, take as many as you need. Because my job to Caesar is to make sure you and your people don't make no noise. My job is on the line with Caesar. My job is to make sure you and your local yokels don't make no noise. My job is to keep my job. I mean, do you not understand the incentives in this text? My job is to keep my job. And I keep my job by making sure you do what you need to do to keep your people in line. And it says they gave him a watch of soldiers. Some said it was may have been as many as 32 soldiers so that there were four shifts of eight so that eight could be on guard at any time and the others could sleep, take a break, go for a walk. Um, The number is not uncertain, but there was enough so that and realizing nobody can stay awake three days that while some slept, others were at alert at the ready. And they not only had a watch, soldiers outside the guard, but as an extra layer of protection and accountability, it said they put a seal in adhesion around the tomb, like a seal on a pharmaceutical in the store where there's a seal or a dairy product, a seal so that you know no one has tampered with it, because if you tampered with it, you'd break the seal and you know somebody been in there. So they put an adhesion around it and sealed the tomb. And Dr. Deal was done. They wanted to make sure there was no break in. Never dawned on them that what they really had to fear was a breakout. (laughs) And then early in the morning, Sunday morning, as the old preacher said, before the dew, while the dew was still on the roses. Early in the morning before the bird, the robins sang their first song. They said that... uh, Heaven then responded, and God must have leaned over and told some of those celestial beings, get on down to that graveyard outside Jerusalem. It's time for my son to get up. An angel, a celestial being dispatched with infinite speed, came with the infinite power of the Almighty and rolled away that stone. He was dressed in all white and then sat on the stone, chilling. But his descent was seen by the soldiers on the watch. And he said it startled them. These are men who have seen the guts and the gore of, of a battlefield with the ghastly debris of human remains, severed limbs, dismembered bodies, rotting corpses of man and beast. But they had never seen nothing like this. They had seen and faced mortal danger that they could fend off with a sword, but now they were dealing with something that their sword could not cut. As Martin King said of those Billy Club hate field policemen in Birmingham when they crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge. We had a fire that fire hoses couldn't put out. They, we had a fire that police dogs couldn't bite. 
As the angel descended, there was nothing in their military training that prepared them to deal with something that was infinite in nature, something that was transcendent, something that was immortal in nature. And it says that these men who were battle tested but were naive when it came to divine things, that at the sight of the angel, they fainted. They literally fainted. And when those band of Hebrew women, who according to Matthew's tradition, it was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they came to the tomb and they were stepping over bodies. Of men who were not asleep, they were unconscious. Because they had passed out. And the angel comes in and tells them he's not here. He is risen Go tell his disciples to meet him in Jerusalem. And they whisk away to begin to tell the three words that split history into A.D. and B.C. He is risen. And the text tells us that while the women are whisked away with good news, Judas goes back to his collaborators, his colluders, his co-conspirators, he's now had a burst of conscience. He's got buyer's remorse. And he goes back to the Pharisees with the receipt and wants to do an exchange. And says to them, oh, I have sinned against innocent blood. And they say to them callously, what is that to us? You could tell this was not their first rodeo in terms of doing under the table deals. There's no return policy here. There's no exchange. There's no buyer's remorse. All of these kinds of deals are final. You deal with it. While the women are shuffling off to tell the world good news for the living dead and the unborn, Judas becomes a prisoner in his own mind, and and they told him to deal with it, and he can't deal with it, and he runs and he hangs himself. Psychologists tell us that people kill themselves typically not because of what they have to live without, but what they can't live with. They don't kill themselves because they have to live without a flat screen TV. They don't kill themselves because they have to live without some ropes and some blingers. They don't kill themselves because they can't get down to Vegas. They don't kill themselves because they can't access the material bennies of life. They kill themselves because of secrets that explode in their soul that they can't drink enough to numb their psychic conscience because of regret and remorse over dirty ghastly deals they've done that they that's got their mind all tied up they can't sleep at night they're haunted by day and haunted by night and the only way to end the internal torment is to end my life itself judas hangs himself because he learned the hard way our money ain't good money (laughs) these days of backyard deals and you know, under money in politics and only fans online. I told you my daughter told me about only fans. Our money ain't good money. But the Pharisees are not done negotiating deals for people's compliance with evil. They're done with Judas, and Judas is done. He got God. But now when the soldiers wake up, they don't know that the women have come. They don't know. They didn't actually see the resurrection. All they know is that the tomb was empty. The stone was he, It was there. Last we remember, he was in there. Last we remember, now the stone is removed. The body gone. We don't, we don't know if he got up or resurrected or somebody stole. We, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know because we, 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 was, we were a little bit out of sorts. And what they do know is that they all took the sanctum militia 
the oath of the military, which says that I will faithfully discharge all of my orders. I will never abandon my post. And I'll never attempt to avoid death for the glory of Rome. And they knew that if you have been given custody of a Roman asset, you're literally to guard it with your life. If they escape, you fall on your sword. It's the only honorable death. If they fight you and overwhelm you and get away, you fall on your sword. If you go AWOL and we catch you, you will wish you had fallen on your sword. But the bottom line, if you have been given custody to God, an asset of Rome, and it gets away from you, pay for it with your life. And better that you take your own life than what we will do to you before your life is finally gone. So they know that there's a death sentence with each one of their names with it. And now they have a problem. If they go to Pilate, whom they work for, it is certain death. So they go to those who collaborated with them. They go to these sneaky, so-called religious leaders. They go to the chief priests and the elders, to Caiaphas and crowd. They say, we got a problem. Jesus ain't there. We saw something we ain't seen before, and we just, we couldn't help it, and, and next thing we know, he ain't there, and they said, this is what we're going to do. You're going to say that his people came in the night and stole his body away. If we say that, we're going to die, but hold up, hold up here. You're going to say that, that they stole the body away. You're not going to say nothing about no resurrection. Pilate's interest is to keep his job and keep his job by keeping us quiet. Our interest is to keep control and this itinerant is threatening our crow control and thinning our crowds. Your interest is to stay alive. And right now, my interest and your interest align. And here's what it's going to cost you to have us go to Pilate. Who's going to be mad that Jesus is gone, but he still needs us to control the local people. So we're going to go to Pilate and advocate for an exception to the rule and allow you all to stay alive. But in order for us to advocate for you, quid pro quo, this is going to be the story. Not that he resurrected, but that his disciples came in the night while we were sleeping and took him. And it says that for that... What they negotiated says they gave them large sums of money. Which is ironic, Sarah, because they only gave Judas $264 and some change. They got Judas on the cheap. It doesn't tell us exactly how much money, but it could be, it could be fairly described as a large sum of money. Apparently, in that local economy, it costs more to buy a soldier than a brother standing on the corner. Brother, a knucklehead on the street corner, probably you can get cheaper than a cop. And a dirty cop is probably cheaper than a judge. (laughs) And a judge is probably cheaper than a senator. And I don't know how much it cost Putin to get a president. I know he got one. Because I know what a man's got and got. I just did. And the text is clear. It says, and they took the money. Jesus took the money. The soldiers took the money. Did I tell you? Evil is always attempting to negotiate and renegotiate the price of our cooperation. 
This past week, evil was down in Marilaga negotiating the price of the speaker's continued cooperation with a lie. And after a couple of days of negotiation, it cost him the ridiculousness, the asininity of coming out and saying that Congress will pass a bill that includes things that are already law. To make us think they're offering something new to fend off a challenge from a woman who sets the women's movement back at least 75 years, if not 100. Because she's not only blonde, but she's blonde and stereotypically dumb and loosely latched to sanity. (laughs) But he's finding out like Ahab of old, hell hath no scorn, hell hath no fear like a woman scorned. Particularly if the woman is not only scorned, but she's crazy. But we've seen people, how evil has been negotiating a price for, for, for people. For, for, for Nikki Haley, the price of trying to get the Republican nomination was for her to say that this nation was never designed to be racist. As if she never read the Constitution that enshrined slavery and said that black people were only three-fifths of a human being and then for only representative purposes. As if she did not know that her own Indian father who came here as an immigrant got a PhD in Canada but came to the United States slapped in the face with American racism and with a PhD stayed unemployed until he applied for a job on the campus of an HBCU and denied her own lived experience with American racism because that was the price of running for office to try and get the nomination of a party that features and, and provides aid and comfort for white grievance. Evil is always negotiating the price of our cooperation. Our public officials could not even speak out loud what they knew to be manifestly true. That Joe Biden won the last election by almost 8 million votes, but they couldn't say it. And the price for winning their next election, for not being primaried, was that you act as if you don't know who won the last election. Evil. He's always negotiating the price of our cooperation. But bring it a, a, a little closer to home. It's not just big folk in big, faraway places. It comes close to home. I had some friends of mine who, pastor friends of mine, they said, Braxton, do you smoke? I didn't smoke? No, I don't smoke. You smoke cigars? No, 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 no. I said, went walk through an emphysema ward. Mm-hmm. Smoking nothing. Never did no cigarettes back in the day. Never smoked no weed. I thought it was funny enough just to watch the change behavior of those who do. <laughs> I've done a lot of things in my life. I just didn't do that. And as you smoke cigars, and I said, ah. Went to a conference and everybody was getting together and I got up the next morning and said, I thought you guys were going to call it. No, man. As it turns out, Clarence, they didn't want me to go to their late night gathering because I would throw water, cold water on the fire because I don't smoke. Apparently, entree into their fellowship to be in their coveted presence was that I had to smoke cigars. But I got word that two of the individuals who were in that coveted circle two years ago, they're now dealing with lung cancer. All access ain't good access. They were negotiating with me. And that, that's something simple and something silly. But how, how, how many people stay silent 
on a job. When you see corruption in a corporation. But the person that you might have to report does your annual evaluation. And has power over whether or not you are promoted in the ranks. Evil is always negotiating the price of our cooperation. Stephen Sizer wrote the book about Christian Zionists. He says that evil negotiates along a five-part spectrum with would-be people of conscience. He says, the first thing evil does, y'all got time for this? He says, uh, the first thing evil does is evil tries to um, co-opt you or ingratiate you. Evil tries to ingratiate you. It tries to give you a piece of the pie, a slice of the pie, ingratiate you, give you a little, break you off a piece. Because one does not try to then report or blow up what you've had a little taste of, uh, little taste. Touch your neighbor and say, little taste. Little taste. And uh, most people, it says evil, can negotiate right there and ingratiating you. Because most of us want to be a part of so bad, so thirsty for certain things. <laughs> and uh, if, if ingratiating you doesn't work, then evil tries to intimidate you. Evil tries to let you know what it can do to you. If you don't comply, if, if ingratiating you and intimidating you doesn't work, then evil tries to isolate you. Evil will talk about you in the broader mind or network so that people will shun you because association with you is now problematic for them. He says, well, if, if, if ingratiating and intimidating and isolating doesn't work, then evil tries to implicate you, try to bring up some kind of charges against you. He says, then if, if, if evil cannot get what it wants from you, bend you to its will by ingratiating and intimidating and then isolating uh, and then implicating, then evil will finally execute you. But evil is always trying to negotiate or renegotiate the price of your cooperation. In Stephen B. Oates' book, Let the Trumpet Sound, that some consider to be the best biography ever written on Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Stephen B. Oates was also the author of the book on the, uh, the biography on Abraham Lincoln called Malice Toward None. He says in there how uh, when the March on Washington was planned, that John Kennedy, who ran on a platform of civil rights, dispatched his son, Bobby Kennedy, who was the hammer. John was the smiling, ingratiating uh, articulator of the new frontier. He was the symbol, the embodiment of Camelot. His brother did the dirty work. And he went to Martin King trying to call off this march on Washington because it would be a stain on the record of the Kennedys, uh, a white eye. I don't call it a black eye because all the eyes in my family are black. It would be a white eye against the Kennedy administration if the largest public demonstration in the nation's history of civil rights happened on the watch of a president who's trying to be a friend of civil rights. And they offered Martin King Cash, cars, and white women. Because they thought it would appeal to him. He said he refused it, and Bobby angrily came back and said, well, let's try wiretapping. When ingratiating didn't work, Said to J. Edgar Hoover, the demented cross-dressing head of the FBI. And when I say cross-dressing, I'm not throwing shade at trans people. 
I'm throwing shade at hypocrisy because a man who kept files on everybody's contradictions but himself was in the closet about his real identity, that's hypocrisy. And, and it says that he, he had these so-called uh, compromising tapes on Martin Luther King, called him in his office and said, stop all your civil rights activity and in fact, I want you to kill yourself to protect your legacy so that we'll leave your dead man walking and send these tapes to your wife, to everybody in Congress. And Martin King told him, you must do what you must do and I must do what I must do. Because intimidation didn't work and, 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 and isolation didn't, didn't work. But evil was trying to negotiate a price with him. Evil tries to negotiate a price with our young people and not so young people when they gather at parties on a Saturday night, a Friday night, and, and the, the drinks get to flowing, and, and as the drinks get to flowing, the hands get to groping, and a friend who's had too much to drink is not mindful of her boundaries, and like swirly, swirling sharks who sense blood in the water, you see something about to happen and you should say something, you should jump in and save her from herself and the crowd, but then you want to make sure that you don't damage your own next invitation. You don't want to damage your own place in the peer rankings. You don't want to damage your hard-fought entree into the in crowd on campus. So you sit there and pretend like you don't see what you saw. Evil. It's always trying to negotiate a price for our complicity. When you sit there and laugh at a racist joke because the joke was told by your boss or you're the first woman and all the boys are laughing. So you laugh too. Or that nervous laughter when his hand goes someplace it don't belong but you need this job. Evil is always, always, always negotiating. It might pay you chicken change if you'll settle for chicken change. It might pay you big bags of money or the equivalent of it. But if you got a price, it'll reach it. You know, somebody's going to get mad at me for saying this, but pick a number, stand in line. We didn't know what Bill Cosby was doing, but everybody in Hollywood did. It was a secret everybody in Hollywood knew. Some of those women, not all of them, and perhaps not most. Some of them women knew exactly well what the price was for getting Bill Cosby's advocacy for a role. And they didn't feel a victim until he didn't come through on his end. Not all of them and not most of them. But some people very consciously will negotiate. Some of the complainants against P. Diddy now, grown men. Who talked about when they were grown men. So-called sexually molested in a studio, sound studio, mix and music came up behind them. And sexually molested them. As a, we're not talking about a 10-year-old child, a 12-year-old child, but a grown man with a grown man's body mass. And my question to the grown man who didn't feel a victim till afterward, to Pete did he didn't get you where you wanted to go, how come when he did it in the first place, whatever arm he put on you was still attached to his body? Where's your agency? I have much compassion for real victims. But people who want to enact a civil suit against a Michael Jackson, I ask them, 
What was wrong with you when you allowed your 12 year old child to spend the night with a grown man? A slumber party. Grown men don't do slumber parties. How thirsty are you for your child to become a star? How many dollar signs did you see that you were willing to commit infanticide to put your child's bodily integrity on the line so that you get paid and then when you get a check, now you want to send a a suit. Negro, sit down somewhere. You evil negotiated that price with you. There are victims and then there's people who realize you're sold out for chicken change and there is no return policy. That's tight, but that's right. I went to a conference once. I probably shouldn't tell you this, but I was... First time I got on the plane... Went down to San Jose, California, and a man who was presenting saw him in the hallway, and he, I didn't know where the conference check in was. He was black, I assumed he was there with the conference. And uh, he said, I am, I'm one of the presenters. Oh, he had instant credibility with me. I said, Okay, I've checked into my room, I need to go get pick up my packet. And he says, Okay, I'll walk with you. He said, would you mind if I stop by my room first? He said, 19 years old. Okay. Got to his room, I stood outside. And men don't go in other men's rooms. Not men like me. I'm just saying. My mama used to ask questions like, why was you there in the first place? So he said to me, oh, you can come on in. I just got to get some stuff. And I said, no, no. I said, no. And I wasn't thinking nothing at the time. So then I, 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 I stepped inside the door. And then he asked me, he said, do you have a girlfriend? And the Holy Ghost said to me right then, oh, hell no. It was the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost. I know when I heard it. Somebody said that was the Holy Ghost. That was the Holy Ghost. <laughs> now I was 215 pounds, bench pressing 425 pounds at the time. And I said, no, I said, I, I, dude, I'm gone. I'll find it by myself. And he got up and he tried to run past me and block the door. And I immediately went right from New Testament to Old Testament. <laughs> And next thing you know, this grown man is sitting on the ground. He done wet on himself and he's begging me, please don't hurt me. Please don't hurt me. Every gland in my body had opened up. And I was going to kill him deader than dead if he didn't move away from that door. I grabbed the jagged edge. I grabbed a lamp and busted off and took the jagged edges and I put it right through his throat. I will slice you deeply and repeatedly. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I'll take my chances with the judge. (laughs) Ain't no price. A whole lot of people become victims because they try to negotiate a price. And I feel for those who are true victims, but some people negotiated and didn't get what they wanted on the back end. Martin King had no price. Evil is always. Sometimes our children see things. The beginning of their drug dependency began when they just wanted to be included. They knew they weren't supposed to. Their parents told them they weren't supposed to. But the price of inclusion was to go along to get along. And evil was right there negotiating the price Some of our biggest regrets in life 
are the result of us settling. Whether for chicken change like Judas or whether for big sums of professional advancement, of cash, of validation. And at the point where we consider negotiating with evil, whether it's to save your job or to stay in the relationship or win an election, Jesus asked the question, what does it profit to gain the world, to win the election, to get likes? <laughs> you know, Megan the Stallion is telling black women a twerk challenge. We got a black woman on the Supreme Court, a black woman in the East Wing of the White House, black women who were in Congress, black women who are CEOs of companies, black women who are embedded into every layer of American life and society, and now a throwback to the days of female objective if you want to. She's a relic of a former age when a woman was no more valued than her anatomy, challenging women who could be Supreme Court jurors to degrade yourself. What is it profit? You to get those likes. What do you give in exchange for your peace of mind? What do you give in exchange for your good name? What do you give in exchange for your self-respect? What do you give in exchange for living within what you said were your values? What do you give in exchange for being able to look at the mirror and be comfortable with who's looking back at you? What do you give in exchange to be able to sing the old hymn, there's nothing between myself and my savior? All I can say today is that uh, Evil continues to negotiate, attempt to negotiate and renegotiate the price of our cooperation. But I'm here today, and you're here today because Jesus had no price. In the dawning of his ministry, when he was baptized from the Jordan and the spirit descended and said, behold, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and the spirit jettisoned him off into the wilderness. And after 40 days when he was a hungry, because the enemy always comes when we're weak, when there's an opening. And he said to Jesus, he wanted to start a negotiation. He said, turn these stones into bread because he knew he was hungry and he knew he was thirsty. And Jesus said to him, man does not live by bread alone. He did not say man does not live by bread alone, but he said feeding bread for the belly is not priority for over feeding bre living bread, bread of heaven to feed the immemorial hunger of my soul. In other words, he told him, go sit down somewhere. I know that there's something more important than the bread of the belly. There's bread for my soul. Man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you got to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these righteousness for all these things shall be added unto you. Then he took him to the temple and it says he took him to the high fires of the temple and it said cast yourself down and the angels will hold you up like the scripture said don't be surprised when the enemy knows how to quote the book but quoting the book and being right by the God of the book are two different things because a whole lot of times holy words end up in hellish hands they might even turn the book upside down and try to sell it to you for $59.99 you be careful who's holding the book that don't mean that they're holding to God's unchanging hand. Jesus told them, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, he told them, go sit down somewhere. Don't Go sit down somewhere. If I got to make a demonstration of outrageousness, if I got to do something ridiculous so that you can validate me, if I got to act crazy or run around in circles or make some extraordinary sensational gesture so that you can validate who I am, I already know who I am. Yeah. 
I ain't got to jump off no balconies. I ain't got to turn no circles. I ain't got to twerk and put my behind out there. I already know who I am. He said, listen, I will give you all the nations of the world if you just bow down and worship me. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me say, you saying, if I bow down to you, you gonna give me all the nations of the world. Let me tell you something. Have you forgotten before there was a when or a where? I was with my father. I was one of the ones that said, let us make man. And I was in the image. I was there in the beginning and said, let there be light. I was there when I made the dry land appear. I was one of the ones who put fish in the sea, birds in the air, beasts on the ground. How you go off of me to give me the world that I created with my own hand? How you go off of me what I made by just speaking it into existence? I worship my father and my father alone. Have I got a witness? Be careful when people offer you the world. Let me tell you something. God's got the whole world in his hands. Your father is rich in houses and lands. He owns a cattle on a thousand hill and a hill that the cattle are on. And if God is all right with me, God will provide me bread. God will put a roof over my head. God will put clothes on my body. God will make a way for me. God will open doors for me. God will give me what I need. How about that? I don't need you as long as I got God. God can do more for you than the whole world can do behind you. All you can say to the enemy, get thee behind me, Satan. Get behind me. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Have I got a witness? Somebody say, devil, get behind me. Devil, get behind me. I'm doing it God's way. Devil, get behind me. I'm going to stand in righteousness. Devil, get behind me. I'm going to stand on the truth. Devil, get behind me. I'll walk alone if I have to, because I'm never alone, because the Lord is with me. Devil, get behind me, because if you kill me, God will raise me up again. Say yeah. Say yeah.